I really love uh, Werner Von Braun's words. I've learned to use the word impossible with the greatest caution. This is true today more than any other time in history because it was said it was impossible to land an orbital class booster and then reuse it, yet humanity did it. It was impossible for an Indian aerospace company to go to the moon on the first try, yet here we are. My team and I at Team Indus are building a spacecraft that will soft land on the moon and deliver a rover. Only three countries in history have ever soft landed on the moon. One is the United States, the USSR, yeah, the USSR, not the Russians, USSR, and China. And they had the backing of their government organizations and years of spaceflight technology and spaceflight experience. Can you imagine the complexity of a mission like this? It just blows my mind. I know I work there, but still, it kind of blows my mind. <laughs> uh, and this is actually a render of our spacecraft landing uh, on the moon. So let me tell you how all this got started off. In 2007, the XPRIZE Foundation managed to convince Google to sponsor a $30 million prize and called on private companies who have to be 90% privately funded to develop a spacecraft landed on the moon, drive 500 meters while transmitting high definition video and pictures back to Earth. Easy, right? <laughs> uh, we were an outsider. Like we, it seemed like we had no chance, but now we're on the cusp of history. Fast forward to uh, about end of 2010. 31st December 2010 is the deadline for the registration of companies participating in the Google Lunar X Prize, or GLXP. Rahul Narayan, our CEO, was waiting for an Indian company to join the fray so that he could offer his IT experience to the company. But it's 30th December 2010, and nobody has joined. So. He takes a leap of faith, borrows $50,000, and registers himself. 1st January, 2011, he wakes up. He's like, what have I done? Second thing he does, gathers four people around a table, tells them to open their laptops and Google how to build a spacecraft. <laughs> I swear to God. The top results were how to build a spacecraft out of paper, bread, and sugar. Apparently, even NASA thinks you can't just Google your way to building a spacecraft. Uh, but fast forward many more years, we hire many more talented engineers, read thousands of papers, and now it's 2014. GLXP has sent a group of judges down to our company to see if we have what it takes to cut it in the competition. This is make it or break it. If we don't pass this, we have no chance in hell. And we nail it. We walk away with $1 million and the Terrestrial Milestone Challenge Prize. This catches the attention of ex isro scientists. And now we are over 100 people strong with many ISRO scientists who combined have over 600 years of spaceflight experience. It also catches the eyes of many giants in the Indian economic sphere. And they not only believe in our mission, they believe in what our mission can do for our society, the impact. Just, just try to imagine that is what we are trying to achieve. We're going to land on the moon. So let me introduce you to some of the stars of our little thing. Uh, so on the right, we have, weighing in at about 650 kilograms, is our lunar lander. That's pretty much what I work on. Uh, it's called HHK for Hum Honge Kamyab. <laughs> on the left, our nice, sweet, cute lunar lander called ECA, or Ek Choti Si Asha. 
this, this is what's going to the moon. So let me take you, take you on a ride. Imagine you're now on the top of a rocket. You're going five, four, three, two, one, lift off. Everything around you is vibrating. It's dark. You start accelerating. You have slipped the bonds of Earth. You start racing into the sky. Going supersonic. Hypersonic. And then, for a minute or so, the first stage cuts up. You're in free fall. Then suddenly, the second stage kicks in and starts accelerating you further. But now, you're above the Earth's atmosphere. There is no sound. Just the acceleration you feel as you race faster and faster towards the moon. And then, snap. The rocket cuts out. A spacecraft is freed from the final rocket stage. And now, we're on our way to the moon. The spacecraft wakes up for the first time and goes, is everything OK? Did everything survive? We wait in mission control, just waiting to hear from our spacecraft. Like, did everything survive that really, really violent ride to the heavens? And the reply comes back. Everything is A-OK. -okay. We all go. We turn, we send up instructions to the lander to turn its solar panels towards the sun as it settles in for the long voyage to the moon. It's 300 and 84,000 kilometers to the moon. It'll take us over 20 days to get there. So sit back and relax. It's 20 days from now. 20 days later, <laughs> we, the moon is much, much bigger than it was when we took off. And we picked up a lot of speed to get there. If we continue how we're going now, we would actually escape the Earth-Moon system. We're going so fast. We won't be captured around the moon. So what do we do? Well, we need to slow down. So we send our instructions up. It's like, slow down. So the spacecraft turns itself and points its engine along the velocity vector. And boom, full throttle. The engine fires up and starts slowing our spacecraft down. And the next thing we know, we're receiving instructions that it is now in lunar orbit. It's in our S1 orbit, our cylindrocentric one. Over the next couple of hours, we fire our engine a couple more times to reduce our orbit slowly and slowly till we hit our S4 orbit, at which point we're only 12 kilometers above the surface of the moon. 12 kilometers. Imagine that. That's like just above Mount Everest. But thankfully, there's no atmosphere, so we're not just going to fall and break. So now, we send it some of its final instructions in orbit. We tell it, it's time for you to land. And the spacecraft switches to automatic mode due to the time lag between Earth and the moon, which is about two seconds round trip. We cannot directly control it while it lands. So now, it's on its own. It fires up its engines for the last time. Full throttle, and it starts descending. It is traveling nearly 1.7 kilometers a second, and it needs to get it down to less than five meters a second. Just, just imagine how ridiculous that is. And we just wait. At Merimbrium, our landing site, Dawn is just breaking. This is really useful because our landing cameras can use the shadows on our, on the, from the rocks to decipher whether it's safe to land in that area or not. But now, it's slowly headed there, and we can do nothing. We can just wait and hope that all our calculations, all our simulations, and all the years and years of hard work we put into this gets pulled off. And we wait. And we wait some more. Mission control is silent. 
And then we receive a signal. Contact light. We have successfully soft landed on the moon. But wait, everything's not done yet. We have stuff to do now that we're here. We send the signal saying, release the Krakens. Uh, I mean, release the rovers. <laughs> uh, since we're carrying two rovers, one for our Japanese partners, Hakuto, and one our own tiny cute one, ECA. We're also carrying uh, experiments from the Indian Institute of Astrophysics and the Italian Institute for Nuclear Physics. Um, also, our ECA is really cute. It has French eyes. The French Space Agency uh, gave us the cameras to use as its eyes. <laughs> it has a very multinational payload. Let's go back to Earth now. We have been trying to inspire the next generation to do their own moonshots. Education is so important in uplifting a society. So we started an initiative called Moonshot Wheels, which goes all over India and brings a tiny bit of space to the people at home. It has traveled over 12,500 kilometers all over India and touched the lives of over 42,000 children in government schools. And I just, I just hope we've managed to instill in at least a few of them to try for their own moonshot one day. We also started a competition called Lab to Moon, where anybody under the age of 25 could uh, design an experiment to help human civilization on the moon. 3,000 teams applied for this. We managed to whittle it down to around 25 and told them to build their prototypes. We selected 15 of those and flew them from all around the world to our Bangalore office. There, a judging panel selected this one, a winner, to fly to the moon. But there were so many awesome experiments, we decided, why just one? We're going to do six. We're going to send six soda cans worth of experiments to the moon. And that's what we're going to do. It's going out there. We really believe that women in STEM should, it's so lacking nowadays. You know, like, it is disproportionately male. You can see it everywhere. So we really tried to push for STEM education directed directly at girls. They were taught how to use GMAT. It's kind of like our orbit software, that they map orbits and stuff. And <coughs> they were taught by ISRO scientists and all the engineers that have been working on this project for years. It was, just, it was just amazing to see. We really hope that this mission not only carries the aspirations of Team Indus, because we spent so many years on this project, but it has the aspirations of everybody who ever aspired to be a multi-planetary species. Just look beyond the stars. And I just want to end this by saying, this is my personal moonshot. What's yours? Thank you very much. <laughs>